Hi guys, I'm Kevin Sakur, and welcome to this digital download on the ICSA Level 4 requirements for breathwork. Up until now, we've been exposed to a lot of research and a lot of information, but fundamentally, the first three levels of breathwork actually compress into a very, very tight practice. In Level 1, we saw that while we can breathe entirely in and out through the nose, that that's really ideal mostly for relaxation purposes. For purposes of performance, against resistance or in heightened stress, it's actually ideal to breathe in through the nose to limit the amount of air that we take into the body and out through the mouth to maximize the expenditure of that exhaust. We likewise saw that breathing doesn't consist of only the two phases we often think of, inhaling and exhaling, but rather has four phases, inhalation, fullness, exhalation, and emptiness. And we saw a variety of exercises for stretching and exaggerating those four phases to really build those controlled pauses, beginning first with a square, and then in some cases customizing it and taking ownership to making it more of either a rectangle or an inverted triangle. In level two, we introduced the idea of sufficiency, the idea that breathing in its own right can either create its own form of tension and waste energy in the body, or else create a, sta a state of heightened relaxation and elite performance. We saw that connected to learning to control that impulse to overbreathe, we sometimes need to recover. And we introduced the idea of burst breathing. This idea that we can either take small sipping inhales and small spouting exhales, or else, depending on our nature. And we also saw that if we overuse burst breathing, that we start to replicate the symptoms of hyperventilation and can actually create and induce hyperventilation. So it becomes very, very important that we use it sparingly. In level three, we explored the difference between cognitive breathing, something that I would do in a preparatory state, going into stress before an exam, before breaching a room, before going into a, a heightened, escalated situation, and truly reactive breathing, where I learned to let the body's movement affect and guide my breathing. Like a sponge being wrung out, water coming out, or else being released, water being pulled in. And tightly connected to this reactivity, we explored the notion of punctuation, of letting <laughs> the movement of the body guide the breathing of the body. Now at level four, we're going to compress all of those three more tightly together and show you how we can apply all of that work in a very relevant and directly tactically applicable context. We are going to be exploring the rather unpleasant but extremely necessary idea of breath deprivation. What it's like becoming familiar rather than fearful of operating in states of breath lacking and how to recover from it. What we must understand, guys, is that we are all puppeted, puppeted and, and subject to our biology. We are all prone to flinching, we are all capable of being surprised, of overwhelmed, or even at a purely physical level of just being gassed. The most elite athletes in the world gas, and it is precisely those that come back from complete deprivation of recover that become legendary, because that is really the personification of, of will and triumphing over, over our biology. So we're going to be giving you a wide variety of exercises. It is fundamentally very simple. The concepts that you see will make sense quickly, you'll understand them, and I will be giving you a lot of different exercises. Some of them will follow a very predictable order, and you will start to plug into the, you know, the pieces before it even is, sort of falls into place and you'll understand it, but it's very tempting at that point to just dismiss it. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of doing the work. You need to explore it. While you may start to see the rhythm and the drills and how they're developing, Cognitively understanding this work and physically experiencing it are two completely separate things. Every single time I do this work, I have new insight and new revelation into my failures, into my fears, what uh, Takawan Soho called our abiding place, our stopping point, where our mind fixates on ourself and where we go inside rather than becoming strong. So it's very, very important that you look at this work objectively, that you explore it, that you build on it and extrapolate and make it your own. Test it. Drill it with your students if you have a crew. Drill it with your friends if you have a partner. Drill it alone if you're alone. But 
find no reason not to do this work. I'll try to give you as many different variations as possible uh, in sportive context, in solo training, in group training, and in self-defense context. But fundamentally, guys, it is imperative that you get on the mat, get into your garage, get into your training regime, and apply this work. Let's get into it. Now we're gonna begin by revisiting the square breath exercise from level one requirements. As we saw in level one, the square breath is fundamentally the idea of dividing a breath into four phases, inhalation, fullness, exhalation, and emptiness. The most important thing to know here is that in level one, we said that most people as a starting point can safely handle doing roughly a three second inhale, a three second hold, a three second exhale and a three second empty hold. But we caution that this so-called 3333 square is not some kind of uh, dogmatic, ideal, perfect square that we should all try to fit ourselves into. We use it because for most of us, it's a convenient and comfortable starting point. And as we saw in level one, once we've done it for a few minutes, we get a good idea of what we're able to comfortably and relaxedly stretch longer and what we would prefer to compress to a shorter length. The most important thing we learned in level one breathing was that that shape, that square, needs to be customized and it can quickly become a rectangle or an inverse triangle. That's what we would refer to as customizing it towards comfort. Now the focus of level four is dealing with deprivation and recovery. So now we're no longer concerned with your comfort. In fact, we are concerned with your discomfort. Our goal here is to make us far more familiar with the state of breath deprivation so that all of the symptoms and body changes, all of the psychological affectations that it has are no longer as fearful. Gradually, we slowly and progressively replace those fears, those specific apprehensions with familiarity. So our goal here is really to explore the unpleasant. To that end, we're gonna re-begin with our square breath. And all I would like you to do is authentically and genuinely revisit it, trying to do a three second inhale, three second fullness, three second exhale, and three second emptiness. I would like you to do this about 10 to 12 times to really feel a comfortable groove. Every single day we're different. Some days you're gonna start it and you're gonna over breathe or inhale too quickly. Other days you're gonna exhale too quickly. Some days you're gonna hold full or empty with strain. We want it to be slow and comfortable with the full three seconds shared for the inhalation. Comfortably maintained full without bloating or stress in the face or neck or body. A slow, equally partitioned exhale seeping out. And a comfortable, stress-free holding empty. All of you need to do this now. Guys, I recognize that it's very, very tempting to say, I've got it in my brain, I wanna move on. But the body needs a reminder. And to really have any benefit or effect from this training, Take a minute, hit pause now. I will see you on the other side of 10 to 12 of these circuits. All right, guys, now I hope you have all done those breaths sincerely and you have paused it. If you have, you'd acquired some degree of familiarity again with that breath, even if you're doing it every single day, any given moment when you do it, it's somewhat new and somewhat different if you allow yourself to re-experience it. Now that we have that baseline, I want you to ask yourself, first reflex response, which of those four phases is the least comfortable? Which one gives you the most difficulty? For the majority of people, it's holding empty, particularly as the phases become longer later on. For others, it's inhaling too quickly. For some, it's exhaling too quickly. For some, it's being full. And being full in the lungs, they automatically bloat and become very tense. Whatever your first reflex answer was, it was phase two, phase three, whatever it was, it is the correct answer. I want you to now take that leg, that side of the square, and that is gonna be our struggle side. That's gonna be the side we're gonna add stress to. Let's say for the sake of argument that holding empty was my least comfortable phase. What I'm going to do now in repeating the square is I'm going to inhale for three, hold full for three, exhale slowly for three, and now elongate my chosen empty length to four seconds. And I'm going to go three, 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 four for a number of repetitions. Holding for three, seeping out very slowly for three, and then holding empty for four. Once I've done that four, five, six times and it becomes a little bit comfortable and it's becoming increasingly consistent, I'm going to increase that leg to five. 
three, 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 five, three, 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 five. Again, another four to six reps. Then I'm going to increase it to six and progressively to seven and slowly to eight. And I'm going to keep growing it. And then eventually I might get to three, 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 15. 33320. But I want to find where I start to very much struggle. Let's say for the sake of argument, I can do three. Hold. Exhale. And empty. And then right there, I want to start to breathe again. And I would continue. Let's say I identify that 13 or 14 is really a comfortable, manageable max. I would like to stay there. As soon as I see that I've gone a little bit too far, I take it back one. And I want you to go to that maximum comfortable length in your shape. So it could again be any of the four legs that you've chosen, whatever your first reflex or first instinct is, it is the correct one. Take that one single phase and progressively elongate it by one count. Stay there for a number of repetitions. Evolve at another count. Stay there for a number of reps, as many as you need. If you think you can go up roughly every one or two, you do it. But always go up only by one. Don't jump. If you're at three, 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 and you're like, man, three is so easy. I'm going to go right to eight. I don't have time. There's value in every single step. Learning how to slowly divide your step because experience, context, and opportunity can be different every single time. And we need to teach our body not simply to breathe the way that it's comfortable to breathe, but to learn how to breathe in every single context. So I'm going to ask you again. Hit pause. Go do the elongation. This one's going to take a little bit more time, and I will see you on the other side of this one. Okay, guys, now this exercise is different for every single person. The first reason is that every single person will have a different stress phase that they choose to elongate. The second is that we all respond differently to elongation and stress in each phase. But there are some commonalities. In my experience and in the experience of teaching many, many people this method, what I notice is that if, for example, I find that the inhalation phase is the most problematic for me, if I start to place emphasis on elongating the inhale, teaching myself to stretch at 5, 10, 15 seconds, inhalation, in order for it to be slowed down, it needs to be very relaxed, exactly like exhalation. The in and the out, once they're slowed down and once we learn how to sort of equal it out and level it out and take small little pieces progressively, our body on a whole will relax more. It tends to bring more mindfulness to practitioners. And what you'll notice is that the other phases, particularly the emptiness and the fullness, will probably feel prematurely rushed if we leave them till three. We're gonna to want to expand it. When I can get my inhalation up to a 12, 15, or 20 second count, I naturally want to start at least holding my breath for five, six, seven, eight seconds, full and empty. It doesn't feel comfortable to rush through it. That's a very natural and beneficial effect of a long, slow inhale, and it speaks to the merits of that type of uh, sort of oxygen saturation training. By comparison, if I talk about holding my lungs full of bloating, once the body is done, You'll see the inverse. Oftentimes people will want to rush through the exhale very, very fast. They'll be full, 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 and they want to expend very quickly and stay empty very, very little in order to get back to the inhalation. So prolonging fullness might make your alternate phases shrink in comparison. Similarly, if I'm working on a long, slow exhale, like the inhale, it'll tend to calm people down a little bit more. And what I notice is that on inhalation and exhalation, when those are prolonged, people tend to slow the rhythm of their counting down. They become very, very relaxed. You're doing it driving, you slow down. You're doing it walking, your pace slows. You can see this very manifestly in a group of people. When I hold on the empty phase with nothing in the lungs, the longer it goes, when I get to the, again to that stress point, when the body is very, very much struggling, whether it's 60 seconds or whatever the case is, when I now go back to my inhalation, fullness, and exhalation, you'll see that those phases again want to be short. So holding in any given phase can either cause the other phases to stretch longer or want to stretch longer or to compress and become shorter. Once we start getting to that phase where the other lengths, the other sides want to change in length, that is when we begin to start to authentically feel our breath. Up until that point, it's been a cognitive exercise. You're operating well within your comfort level. 
But once you get to a point where the other lengths are wanting to fluctuate, that's when you know you're hitting your stress level. And you'll know because you'll consciously start to feel a bit of anxiety, a bit of stress. You might get cold and sweaty. You might feel anxiety or heart rushing. Whatever phase you choose, it will affect the other phases. So once you start to get to that stress threshold, it is perfectly normal to slowly and incrementally lengthen or shorten the other phases as you feel comfortable. Again, it's a customization to make it somewhat more comfortable in order for us to go for, further and deeper into the discomfort of that elongated phase. To this end, I would suggest, once you have done your chosen struggle phase, I would suggest that whether in the same training practice or in another session, if you're journaling and logging it, you change your focus. If, for example, you find it most stressful to inhale and you choose for a few days to work on stretching your inhalation, I would then suggest after a few days to then transi to, to transition to holding the fullness long. And then after a few days of that, holding the exhale long. And then finally holding the emptiness long. If you have the time in your training, you're doing a deep breath exercise, you have like a half hour to do it, you might want to cycle through all four in a given training session, allocating five minutes to the exaggerated elongation of each phase. The reason for this is that we have the, the, the cognitive ideal of what we, we believe is the most stressful. I have the greatest difficulty doing this. And it may in fact be your greatest stressor, or it may not be, you might be wrong. But even if it is the most stressful phase, each elongated phase may produce different revelations and realizations. It'll certainly create different changes in the body. If you have impulse problems or impatience, if you have anger issues, they'll be triggered differently by holding each phase. And everybody's different because it's, it's all about how you're, you're made up inside and how you perceive the exercise. So I strongly encourage you as a base level of health work, psychological work, and, and sort of biophysical work for the body just to get used to the stress, teach yourself what it feels like to elongate each of the four phases. Deprivation isn't always about not being able to take your next inhalation. Sometimes it's about not being able to exhale. Sometimes it's about not being able to inhale the way you want or when you want. Each of the phases can be deprived. And in each of those deprivations, we will have different effects on the body. Stop it now, go try some of this out. All right, so quick recap. In level one, we learned that the square needs to be customized and it should be customized to comfort. Now in level four, we've begun by customizing the square towards discomfort to identify our strongest stressors and our strongest emotional triggers in our breathing. So to that end, we have been elongating and exaggerating a single aspect, a single side of that so-called square, that shape, that breath form. Now, in doing the elongation of one, we will start to get towards a stress threshold where we will see and experience affectation of the other three. In this phase, we are now going to symmetrically and equally elongate the square. Now this is more comfortable overall. If I start inhaling for one, holding for one, exhaling for one, and staying empty for one, very comfortable. It can be quite cleansing. It's somewhat akin to sort of that kind of nasal cleansing breathing that you might see in yoga. I stay there for a little bit and then I progressively go up to two, 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 two. Now, this is far more comfortable because psychologically there's that even cadence. The, the work this challenge of this comes from that first time you, you approach the new count, when you go to 3333, three, 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 when you first try 4444. Four, four, four. You have to repartition everything off and reportion it and say, okay, I have to slow my inhale, inhale down even more, slow my exhale down even more. I inhale too quickly, and in accordance with the principle of sufficiency, it added stress to my body. I have to resolve it. Because what happens is, if I inhale or exhale too quickly, my fullness and my emptiness will become tense. If I don't resolve the tension in the fullness and the emptiness, the inhale and the exhale become tense. Then I start to do that too quickly, that too short, and the whole cycle becomes a catch-22 of failure. So I have to go into it really exploring where I'm at, feeling what it's causing in the body, relaxing the tension, and then 
experiencing the breath, feeling the breath leaving, and then just be making peace with the emptiness and continuing. And so now the goal in the symmetrical square is that I evolve each side at the same time, moving from three, 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 to four, 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 staying there for a little bit, five, 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 up to 16, 16, 16, 16, whatever it is that is gonna be your threshold. Now, we will always have one side where we start to experience failure first, but when we have the square symmetrical, the entire structure starts to collapse. So if on my, my fullness hold at 16 or at 20, I start to feel the shuttle tiles flying off the side as I come back in the atmosphere and I'm having a small aneurysm on the inside, probably the exhalation is going to be tough too. Probably the, the, the emptiness is going to be tough. It'll feel good for the first few seconds. You'll probably do it too quickly. You'll start to have despair. You'll lose your timing. Just reset yourself and go back to it. It is so easy for us to use the excuse of losing our timing to say, well, I'm going to stop now. But I really want to stay in it. I want to stay in the exercise, and if I fall off the horse, get back on it right away and stay at the count you're at. If it's unmanageable and too high, just go down one. Just like we want to progressively go up by one at a time and stay there for a number of reps to get used to it, we also want to make sure we go down those steps one at a time and stay on each step for a while. Really, there's, it's impossible to do it for too long. It's only possible to do it too quickly. So take the time you need. Now I want you to explore this. This now becomes much more of a meditative uh, meditation exercise and much more of a, of a muscular exercise, working on the flexibility of the thorax, working on the strength of our inspiratory muscles in exactly the same way we did uh, in level three when we talked about inspiratory resistance, but now in a, in a much calmer, kinder, more tranquil, tranquil way. You may choose to do this laying down. Some people like to do it kneeling, sitting in a lotus position, sitting in a chair. At this point, do it stationary and just allow yourself to experience the change that it makes in you. Now guys, I, I've said it a number of times already and I'm going to keep saying it. I really strongly encourage you to pause and do the work. And when I say pause, it might be a sampler pause where you're doing it for five minutes, six minutes, or it might be a, I'm going to shut the notebook right now and I'm going to work on this for the next little bit. It's really a question of how you choose to do it. But ultimately, it does need to be a, a, a multi-day kind of process where you're stopping, you're giving it the attention it deserves. Some of us are very, very eager and we want to get through the whole thing and see the, the global picture so that we can better contextualize and put everything into slots. And I fully respect that. I just want to make sure that if you do skim through it, you go back. Um, in, a, in, a, in a spirit of, of encouraging you to take time, I'm just going to give you two quick anecdotes. One I've given elsewhere. Um, as many of you know, I started off my, my career, my vocation as, a, as a, an educator, but in fine arts. I was a visual arts teacher. And as a, as a lover of the arts and as a practitioner of many different disciplines in the visual arts, my, my goal in life was to share my passion with my students, whether they be five years old or 20 years old. And one of the things we would do is art appreciation, art education, teach them a bit of history and context. And I would try to really just challenge people to explore their own views, their own feelings, their own beliefs, and to let them be spoken to by the work, rather than tell them this piece is important because I would give them a bit of a historical context, tell them why people think it's important, but ultimately try to encourage people to go where their passion led them, where their interests led them. So it would often culminate with art appreciation, museum visits, and there is no starker contrast than when you can teach a group of six-year-olds not just etiquette and politeness, but just to, to be still and to walk into a museum and to be free of judgment and just to go in and experience art and to look at it. And then you see a six-year-old standing in front of something, a sculpture that you've never addressed with them, a style of art that you haven't dissected with them in any way. And they're just enjoying it for reasons that are completely honest. And I like the color and I like the shape. And they're having an authentic moment. And then they go back to the class or to the, you know, the media room and they're totally motivated to start drawing and painting and they're inspired. And that's the point. That's what it's supposed to be. But then when you have those six years old, six year olds or those 10 year olds or those 17 year olds who didn't think art was cool suddenly finding value in it saying, yeah, this is pretty cool. And then right next to it, you have a tour bus arrive. And that tour bus spews out, you know, 30 to 60 year old people, middle class on vacation. And they're being briskly guided through a museum with 50,000 pieces of art to the six most important pieces that are famously outlined on their checklist pamphlet. And they go in front of these six pieces and they, they listen for five minutes with their earpiece in their chosen language and they briskly zip off and they spend more time in the gift shop than they do in the museum. They never have an authentic moment. They look, they see nothing. 
and they speed past thousands of pieces of inspired, passionate work in which there might have been something that could have changed their entire worldview, their emotional experience. That, to me, is the greatest example of how you want to train versus how you don't want to train. You want to be that wide-eyed six-year-old finding a way to experience anything you've done anew, freshly. The more experience we get, the harder it is for us to truly see. Not just to look with our checklist of assumptions and experiences, but to just clean the slate, blank out the canvas and start fresh. Worst thing you can do is just take a cognitive inventory and have your little brochure with your six pieces that you have to get. And this is, this is really tempting when we talk about certification and requirements because people go, yep, 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 got it, got it, got it, got it, need it. And that's not the point. We've tried to keep the certification as simple as possible because what matters is in the simplicity, there is greater opportunity for customization, inclusion and integration of your own unique experience. But more than that, there's that subtle encouragement. Since the, the, the work is so direct, so obvious and so simple, go and please do it. And I cannot stress it enough. When we're talking about you know, what I feel is the best knife defense versus what you might disagree and, and believe is the best knife defense versus learning how to breathe better. There's no argument. We're talking about breathing and experiencing your own body, learning about your own emotional triggers, learning about what causes fear, what creates anxiety. If you do this work honestly, you might have a totally different opinion from someone else. But your opinion and your insight is your own. It is 100% correct. And this same drill can yield so much benefit, lasting long-term change in your being that I cannot encourage you enough to please take the time to do the work as you go through it. All right, that's enough of the speech. Let's get back to it. Now, for some of us, this type of work is extremely familiar. You might have had this type of tactical breathing in previous styles or training. You might already have some exposure to, to Sistema, and in different schools of Sistema, it's taught at different levels and different orders. I will share my experience with Sistema. There was so much good material, but in my the, the longest portion of my training, there was so much lack of structure that you could attend a camp or a seminar or even a class. And even in the most intimate class, there might be these nuggets of absolute wisdom, but they were thrown out in no particular order. And there were certain things that you could manifestly see were much easier for some people than others. There were some people doing some things correctly, but their fundamental you know, mechanical basis was, was off. You had people not ever understanding what they were doing or why they were doing it. And so I go back to our, our universal principle from Donald Meikenbaum, this notion of, of stress and Inoculation. The first phase has to be education. If you don't know why you're doing it, it's very hard to gain the full result. I, you know, it's, it's sad to say, but as a teacher, it is very tough to connect to somebody who is non-discriminating. If they come in and they just want to smack heads, you know, they kind of come in like a caveman. You have to appeal to them, try to see if the intellect is there. If it's not there, you have to try to find an emotional connection. If that's not there, just going in through aggression to create a revelation is pretty tough. If somebody fundamentally wants to train in a way, for lack of a better term, that's kind of stupid, that's just ignorant and just aggressive, then it's very difficult for them to appreciate this work. You need to understand that breath is a bridge that can be both autonomic and cognitive. You need to know that breath as a bridge can affect all of our body systems. You need to know that there's value, there's evidence, there's research, there's proof, and there's direct experience that breath is necessary, that it can improve your tactical performance and your overall quality of life. The life you're, you're seeking to protect can be fundamentally expanded just by breathing well. There's so much reason for it. If it becomes mundane, pointless, if you don't see the fundamental logic in doing it, then all of these exercises are ultimately going to be limited by that lack of understanding or acceptance or integra integration. So when we start to do this work, it's extremely important that you're allowing yourself to be a, an honest vessel, experiencing it freshly, but it's also important that you, you represent it clearly to your practitioners, to your students. Make it challenging. Find different ways of doing it. When I was first exposed to this breathing, we would do it static, moving, we'd do holding, deprivation, wall hitting, wall boxing. There's all sorts of great value in each of it, but oftentimes it was taught in no particular order. So sometimes as teachers, we have to do the same thing. We have to give kind of a, a quick sampling in order to get people to a certain point so everyone can have different experiences. But in your own training, 
it is important to remember that simply learning to do the square, learning to isolate one phase, and then learning how to isolate all four, whichever you do first, learning those simple phases in a static sitting or laying position is far simpler than doing it while applying it to movement. So even if you're already doing it in movement like I'm going to show now, I encourage you to always remember to go back and take time to do it statically as well. In an ideal world, we would start off stationary like I have on this video. And then once we have some sampling of it, I would then encourage us to go towards movement, if you can. But even if you've already jumped steps in your own training, it's important to go back and plug some of those holes to make sure that we don't have weaknesses in our fundamentals. When we now speak about matching the square or matching the breath shape towards uh, with, with movement. The most simple example is this, to be walking with an even cadence, with an even pace, and every single step represents a count. And so then I would look at doing inhale, fullness, exhale, emptiness. And I would slowly do that until it was comfortable, and then I would do inhale for two steps, fullness for two steps, exhaling for two steps, and so on. As I start to do this work, what matters very much is that I try to make the breath natural. So when I'm stepping, I try not to divide the breath with intentional contraction, but rather try, there might be some small punctuation, but I try to simply move. Holding. And empty. And so this so-called breath walking is a fantastic way to really give you a different experience of your breathing, but also a different experience of your movement. We said in previous chapters that fundamentally breath may well be nothing more than a placebo, what we would term a combat goal or combat objective. It gives you something to focus on that helps bring you back to correct function. I can tell you from experience, I'm a little bit of a robot, I have some reconstructed foot, I had a history of knee injuries that are now 100% good, but I'm always mindful of them, and my body is often quite dinged up. I train a lot in a week, and my body's not getting any younger. There are certain things I love doing, like grappling. There are certain things I hate doing, like running. So if I have to do running, or if I have to do like long hikes, I start to have this experience of self-doubt, where I start to feel pain in my injured foot, or you know where I have metal, or where I have limited mobility in certain parts of my body, and it's very easy to focus on that and to start to self-pity and to worry or become paranoid and say, oh my God, I hope I'm not aggravating my arch. I hope this isn't going to hurt my Achilles. Uh, is my knee getting twingy? And we start to go towards that. If you've ever had a severe injury, there always remains that, that latent paranoia of injuring it again. But what I found when I first encountered systemic breathing is that if I gave myself the goal of matching my steps my pace with my breath, I then had a complete distraction. And then suddenly I could find value. I could find a positive dialogue, a good narrative to explain and justify why I was running. I could run more effectively. I was running free of fear or, or distraction or paranoia. And I was running in a way that was healthier for the body. So in going towards movement, all we seek to do is match our simple, basic steps with the counts of our breath. You might get it up to a, a length of 16, 16, 16, or something arbitrary, but you simply allow it to slowly climb up. The most important thing you'll notice is that slower movement, like slow walking, can much more easily be stretched. Faster movement, like wind sprinting, will generally require faster cycling of breath, and the count will naturally become shorter. So if you ever have an opportunity to walk on flat surfaces versus incline, or do, for example, a slow walk into something quite fast, um, it could even be in your gym. You can walk the length of your gym on a count of eight, for example, and then you could uh, do you know three or four jumping jacks for uh, a very fast burst. You could slow walk the length of a field, and then wind sprint halfway back. Slow walk a certain amount back, and then wind sprint back. And you'll notice that the long breath matches more comfortably with the slower movement, and faster, shorter cycles matches more comfortably with more strenuous exertion. So this is something that you need to find a way to, to uh, explore, even if it's in your basement, in your garage. Again, you could do it on the spot. It could be just pedal walking on the spot for a count of eight, and then for a count of four. Um, but if I simply do long eight, short four right away, I'm not going to feel the value again. So it's always a question of staying in that cycle for a while. I would walk, inhaling for eight, holding for eight, exhaling for eight, holding for eight a number of times. Then I would try to sprint so that I would get through that square, that cycle, at least three to four times. And then I would go back to the previous. So this oscillation between exertion pace 
and breadth length is a very important thing to experience and it will teach you a lot about where you start to feel anxiety and where deprivation starts to creep in and challenge your, your, your breath structure. Now there are a lot of different contexts wherein we can work deprivation. We can take the simple idea of the square breath as we've seen and simply do it in a mindful way, static or while walking or moving. We can apply it to our morning jog. We should also look at how we can apply this to our overall fitness and mobility regime. So if you take the basic mobility exercises that you've seen in previous downloads, let's say take something like a like a, an arm windmill. The arm windmill doesn't really have any massive affectation on the respiration. When I move my arm, there is some slight compression and opening of the upper right quadrant, in this case of my lung, but not so much that I would feel a massive punctuation unless I was windmilling through it with a lot of speed. If I'm working it slowly and mindfully, it's a pretty respiratory neutral movement. There's not a lot of strain going up, there's not a lot of strain or release going down. Unless if I had a, you know, a very severe shoulder injury and there was a point of tightness that I had to be very mindful on, there might be a desire to breathe through the anticipation of pain. Of course, we would never want to do the movement uh, in a way that is painful. We would want to work within our capacity and respect it. But as we get closer to areas that cause fear, there can be a need to release. That would be about the only exception. But assuming a rather stable, healthy, neutral shoulder, it is overall a neutral um, movement for the body. So what we can do is we can take the, the cadence of that movement. This is a longer motion. It takes a second, second and a half at a, at a comfortable pace. And I might say because I want to do it in a mindful, meditative way that I might want to do one full rotation for an inhale, one full rotation for a hold, one full rotation for an exhale, and likewise one full rotation for an empty phase. Every single mobility exercise will have different levels of effect on the thorax and the trunk and therefore on the breath. The neck, the leg, these have the least, these are somewhat neutral. Thoracic mobility will have the greatest, but there is still value in exploring each of them on an inspiratory, a hold, an exhalation, and an empty phase. So this gives you not only a great way to double up your training and maximize your time, but also a nice new fresh perspective on both mobility and breath work. Now beyond simply doing breath deprivation or phasic breathing, four-stage breathing uh, with neutral movement, I can begin to then customize movement phases to match the logical function of the breath. So if, for example, I am performing motions like opening the body, let's say a reverse shoulder shrug, this type of emotion is very natural. We want to take a deep inhale when we want to uh, overcome anxiety or Ugh, yawn or reset the breath. So I could start with a three count or a five count or whatever it is I like with my reverse shrug while inhaling. Then I could take a motion like a, a torso twist and I could perform the torso twist on the fullness. I could also perform it on the emptiness. We have two fundamental reflexes, the startle flinch and the so-called orientation response. In one, we forget to breathe entirely and the lungs just stay bloated oftentimes. There can, there can be a, a, a complete abject horror where the body just doesn't breathe for a second. In the other, in the orientation, sometimes there's a half gasp uh, where you're trying to go through your Rolodex of familiarity to say what is this threat and, and you, you don't come up with a match and so you half inhale and then full. But in both of them, we can find ourselves temporarily bloated shocked and full and therefore the torso is quite tense. In that motion it's very natural to freeze and in order to break out of it I normally need to start moving and start breathing. So one exercise that can be quite beneficial is that I can have my lungs full and then practice something as simple as a torso movement. So this is, this is starting to link the relationship between that bloated state, not something that we want but something that very very, very, very often happens in states of surprise and to teach myself to recover from it. I could, for example, be doing something like going into strike and then just as I'm about to go in, I get intercepted, whoop, I freak out, I plunge low into my hands and I find myself clinching and then I realize in the clinch that I've forgotten to breathe and that I, I have to reset my breathing. I could, for example, have a, a, a loud noise or a bright, you know, a stimuli that shocks me and I forget to breathe. Very often, if we take like, a, like an exchange or a sparring match, for example, 
example, we will we'll find ourselves being overwhelmed and we need to get out of there. We need to shield up and we need to slip and move, but our lungs are full. So yes, we can look at it by, by training ourselves to get more familiar and say to ourselves, start breathing to jumpstart correct movement, but we can also start correct movement to jumpstart breathing. And so one very simple exercise you can do is get the lungs full, and in that state of fullness, practice something as simple as thoracic rotations, torso rotations. When I rotate the torso full and bloated, because they're bloated, they're tenser, and it's a different type of movement, but I become familiar with that. And that motion, naturally, when I rotate full, my body wants to breathe. It wants to behave like a sponge being wrung out, like a dish rag. And so this, this movement, the reflex in my trained arsenal to always be moving, in effect, jumpstarts my breathing. Similarly, I can find myself completely empty. The most common example is I come in with anticipation and expectation. I strike and then right after I do it, oh, I now have to shield up again because I've expended myself and he counter punches me back. And so sometimes I find myself oh, taking a shot on a completely relaxed, open, exhausted uh, lung and then boom, I take the shot and I have to shield up. So again, something simple like slips and thoracic movements while completely empty feels quite different from doing it with any type of breathing that I wish. So I can then take those simple ideas and make a very simple health mobility routine wherein I'm inhaling on the load, not breathing, but just rotating on the fullness, exhaling on the unloading, and then again, twisting and torquing on the emptiness. So now we start to see something that is very manageable, still very mindful, it's adding slight stress, but it's giving us a placebo effect. We have a cognitive goal. We have a, a combative goal. We're trying to focus on these phases with these movements. It is preparing my body for states that I can encounter in actual combat, states of deprivation, of fullness, of emptiness, of not having the time I want or the length I want to breathe. I can stretch each of those four phases to my maximum. I can make the shape symmetrical, making it a long eight second inhale, eight second fullness and so on. I can make it quite asymmetrical. I could say two second inhale, right? And then 10 second rotation full, surviving hell. And then only two seconds to quickly expunge and then 10 second rotations. I can do it however I wish. The possibilities are limitless. But the importance here is that we start to see that by making the movements no longer neutral, but by guiding the type of movement with a reason, with a logic, with a, with a story, if you will, beneath it, now I start to say, how does this apply more directly to combat? It makes that simple mobility training more interesting, more intriguing. When you have somebody recovering from an injury, whether it's physical or psychological, you have somebody with severe trauma, somebody who's deeply afraid of, of contact, you have somebody who's working in complete isolation, doesn't have a training partner. In all of these cases, these are simple exercises that allow us to put our toe into the water of stress, into the water right on the beach of combat, to get closer to application. And then instead of just doing some esoteric kneeling meditation where I'm trying to become one with my finitude and my mortality, to then hopefully become better ultimately at combat, I have something very direct, very obvious, where I say, this I understand. These movements are you know, akin to certain types of striking actions. These movements are akin to certain types of evasions. And I'm applying these breath phases because these happen in these types of contexts. And then right away, your health and mobility work it takes one giant step closer towards combative application. Okay guys, now the next logical step in this progression is then to say, how can I make every phase of the breathing relevant to combative application? How do I make it tactically justifiable? Or if you want to reverse engineer it, how can I apply this breathing to my combative training? So I'm going to appeal to you, the solo trainer. We can all train alone. We don't all have partners. In training alone, let's take something as simple as shadow boxing. Conventionally in shadow boxing, if I simply think of just striking or if I'm thinking of just cardio or maybe I'm applying certain strategies and footwork, typically what will happen is I will inhale when I'm comfortable and then I will exhale on exertion. 
and I'll reset and go out. And this is very common, and it's it's the ideal state. In a in an ideal world, if I have to engage somebody, I want to come in, bah, 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 exhale, recover when I'm ready, or bah, 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 strike, clinch, I recover in my in my inhale. Then whoosh, as I'm ready, start going with strikes again. But let's talk about what can happen. As we hinted at in our previous set, when I go in, bah, 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 striking, if I fail or have to cover up, oftentimes I get startled. And so I would love to have just continued breathing. What can very often happen is freezing. The whole point of training deprivation is not to encourage us to hold our breath or to stay empty, but rather it is to teach us to be more familiar, again, to replace fear with familiarity. So we know what it is to be in that storm, and it makes it easier for us to navigate our way out. So now what we can do as a basic shadow boxing drill is I can inhale as I'm boxing around, and then I go in on my exhale, but I get overwhelmed. So I shield, and during the shielding, my shielding is dynamic, it is mobile, it is akin to churning those shoulders in whatever direction you've chosen, and I move my body, plunging and weaving, while holding, and I can, because I'm matching it with my breath state, I stay there as long as I can until I'm absolutely going to explode, and then I inhale my way back. So in effect, if we talk about this from a behavioral uh, or, or um, conditioned response perspective, I am teaching myself to reward my escape with breathing. You only get to breathe when you escape, but you stay in there as long as possible. I'm teaching myself to become familiar with that hell of having to survive when I have no breath and my body's completely shocked and frozen, and then I go out. And for the purpose of this drill, I could then relax on the outside, empty, Take a little breath and come on in. So again, exhaling, shielding full, 